you tweeted that it's interesting to ponder that if Oort clouds are ever mined by the systems of alien civilizations, mining equipment from billions of years ago could be in our Oort cloud, since the Oort clouds are, they, they, they extend really, 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 really far outside the, the, the actual star. Yeah. Um, that, so, you know, mining equipment, just like basic boring mining equipment out there. I don't know if there's something interesting to say about Oort clouds themselves that, that are interesting to you and about possible non-shiny uh, light emitting uh, mining equipment from alien civilizations. Yeah, I mean, that's all, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of the field of techno signatures and looking for life is you can find inspiration and intellectual joy in just the smallest little thing that starts a whole thread of building upon it and wondering about the implications. And so in this case, I was just really struck by, uh, we kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, the idea that stars are not static. We tend to think of the galaxy as having stars in a certain location from the center of the galaxy and they kind of live there. But in truth, the stars are not only orbiting around the center of the galaxy, um, but those orbits are themselves changing over time, they're processing. And so in fact, the orbits look more like a spirograph. If you've ever done those as a kid, they kind of whirl around and trace out all sorts of strange patterns. And so the stars intersect with one another. And so uh, the current closest star to us is Proxima Centauri, which is about 4.2 light years away, but it will not always be the closest star. And over millions of years, it will be supplanted by other stars. In fact, stars that will come even closer than Proxima within just a couple of light years. And that's been happening, not just we can project that will happen over the next few million years, but that's been happening presumably throughout the entire history of the galaxy for billions of years. And so if you went back in time, it, you know, there would have been all sorts of different nearest stars throughout different stages of the Earth's history. And those stars are so close that their Oort clouds um, do intermix with one another. So the Oort cloud can extend out to even a light year or two around the Earth. There's some debate about exactly where it ends. It probably doesn't really have a definitive end, but kind of more just kind of peters out more and more and more as you go further yeah, away. By the way, for people who don't know, an Oort cloud, I don't know what the technical definition is, but a bunch of rocks that kind of, no, objects that uh, orbit the, the the star and they can extend really, really, really so far the, because of these gravity. These are objects that probably are mostly icy rich. Um, they were probably formed fairly similar distances to Jupiter and Saturn, but were scattered out through the interactions of those giant planets. Um, we see a circular disk of objects around us, which kind of looks like the asteroid belt, but just further away called the Kuiper belt. And then further beyond that, you get the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud is not in a disk, it's just a, a sphere, it kind of surrounds us in all directions. So these are objects that were scattered out through uh, three-dimensionally in all different directions. Um, and so those objects are potentially resources for us, especially if you were planning to do an interstellar mission one day, you might want to mine the water that's embedded within those and use that as either oxygen or fuel for your rocket. And so it's quite possible. Uh, there's also some rare earth metals and things like that as well, but it's quite possible that a civilization might use all cloud objects as a jumping off point. Um, or, or in the Kuiper Belt, you have things like Planet Nine even. So that's, there might even be objects beyond in the Oort cloud, which are actually planet-like that we just cannot detect. These objects are very, very faint. So that's why they're so hard to see. I mean, even Planet Nine is hypothesized to exist, but we've not been able to confirm its existence because it's at something like a thousand AU away from us, a thousand times the distance of the Earth from the sun. And so even though it's probably larger than the Earth, the amount of light it reflects from the sun, the sun is, just looks like a star at that point, so far away from it, that it barely reflects anything back. It's extremely difficult to detect. So there's all sorts of wonders that may be lurking out in the outer solar system. And so this has, leads you to wonder, um, you know, in the Oort cloud, that Oort cloud must have intermixed with other Oort clouds in the past. And so what fraction of the Oort cloud is truly belongs to us, belongs to the, what was scattered from Jupiter and Saturn, what fraction of it could in fact be uh, interstellar visitors. And of course, we've got excited about this recently because of Oumuamua, this interstellar asteroid, which seemed to be at the time the first evidence of an interstellar object. But when you think about the Oort cloud intermixing, um, it may be that a large fraction of comets, comets are seeded from the Oort cloud that, that eventually come in. Um, some of those comets may indeed have been interstellar in the first place that we just didn't know about. 
through this process. Um, there, there even is an example, I can't remember the name, there's an example of a comet that has a very peculiar spectral signature that has been hypothesized to have actually been an interstellar visitor, but one that was essentially sourced through this Oort cloud mixing. And so this is kind of intriguing. Um, it also, you know, the outer solar system is just such a, it's like at the bottom of the ocean. We know so little about what's on the bottom of our own planet's ocean. And we know next to nothing about what's on the outskirts of our own solar system. It's all darkness. Yeah. So like, that, that that's one of the things is to understand the phenomena, we need light. And we, we need to see how light interacts with it or em, what light em, emanates from it. But most of our universe is darkness. So it's, there could be a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, this is where your interest is with the cool, with the cool worlds yeah. and the, the interesting stuff lurks in the darkness, right? Basically all of us, you know, 400 years of astronomy, our only window into the universe has been light. And that has only changed quite recently with the discovery of gravitational waves. Yeah. That's now a new window. And hopefully, uh, well, to some degree, I guess, solar neutrinos we've been detecting for a while, but they come from the sun, not interstellar space. But we may be able to soon detect neutrino messages as even been hypothesized as a way of communicating between civilizations as well, or just do neutrino telescopes to um, study the universe. And so there's a growing interest in what we'd call multi-messenger <laughs> astronomy now. So not just messages from light, but messages from these other uh, physical uh, packets of information that are coming our way. Uh, but when it comes to the outer solar system, light really is our only window. There's two There's two ways of doing that. One is you detect the light from the Oort cloud object itself, which, as I just said, is very, very difficult. There's another trick, which we do in the Kuiper belt especially, and that's called um, an occultation. And so sometimes those objects will just pass in front of a distant star just coincidentally. These are very, very brief moments. They last for less than a second. Um, and so you have to have a very fast camera to detect them, which conventionally astronomers don't usually build fast cameras. Most of the phenomena we observe occurs on hours, minutes, days even. But now we're developing cameras which can take you know thousands of images per second um, and yet do it at the kind of astronomical fidelity that we that we need for this kind of precise measurement. And so you can see uh, these these very fast dips. You even get these kind of diffraction patterns that come around, which are really cool to look at. And that's I kind of love it because it's almost like passive radar. You are you have these pinpricks of light. Imagine that you live in a giant black sphere, but there's these little pinholes that have been poked. And through those pinholes, almost laser light is shining through. And inside this black sphere, there are unknown things wandering around, drifting around that we are trying to discover. And sometimes they will pass in front of those little pencil thin laser beams Mm -hmm. block something out and so we can tell that it's there and it's not an active radar because we didn't actually you know beam anything out and get a reflection off which is what the sun does the sun's light comes off and it comes back that's more like an active radar system there's more like a passive radar system where we are just listening very intently and so um i'm kind of so fascinated by that the idea that we could map out the rich architecture of the outer solar system just by doing something that we could have done potentially for a long time ago, which is just listening in the right way, just just tuning our instrumentation to the correct way of of not listening, but viewing the universe to catch those objects. Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating. It seems almost obvious that your efforts, when projected out in over like 100, 200 years, will have a really good map through even methods like basically transit timing, mm. high resolution transit timing, but basically the planetary and the uh, the planet's satellite movements mm -hmm. uh, that of all the different uh, star systems out there. Yeah, and it could revolutionize the way we think about the solar system. I mean, that revolution has happened several times in the past when we discovered Vesta in the 19th century. Um, that was, I think, the the seventh planet for a while, or the eighth planet when it was first discovered. And then we discovered Ceres, and there was a bunch of asteroid objects, Janus. And so for a while, the textbooks had, um, there was something like 13 planets in the solar system. And then they, and then that was just a new capability that was emerging to detect those small objects. And then we ripped that up and said, no, no, we're gonna change the definition of a planet. And then the same thing happened when we started looking at the outer skirts of the solar system again. We found Eris, we found Sedna, these objects which, resembled Pluto, and the more and more of them we found, make, make. And eventually we again had to rethink the way we even uh, contextualize what a planet is and what the nature of the outer solar system is. 
Um, so regardless as to what you think about the debate about whether Pluto should be <laughs> demoted or not, which I know often invokes a lot of strong feelings, it is an incredible achievement that we were able to transform our view of the solar system in a matter of years just by basically you know, charge-coupled devices, the things that's in, in cameras. Um, those, the invention of that device allowed us to detect objects which were much further away, much fainter, and revealed all of this stuff that was there all along. And so it, that's the beauty of astronomy. There's just uh, so much to discover, and even in our own backyard.